on educating and engaging key stakeholders, part of the Psychotropic Medications Virtual Learning Community webinar series. To eliminate background noise, phone lines are being muted during today's presentation. Question and answer sessions will be held after each presentation and instructions for participation are shown on the screen at this time. If you experience technical difficulties today, you may dial 1-866-229-3239 for assistance. Today's event will be recorded and the slides will be sent to participants after the webinar. At the completion of the webinar, we ask that you complete a very brief online evaluation that will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is very important to us and we hope you are able to complete the survey. I will now turn the webinar over to Kamala Allen, Director of Child Health Quality at the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. We want to thank you to today's technical assistance webinar, part of the Quality Improvement Collaborative and Virtual Learning Community supporting the uh, reduction of inappropriate use of psychotropic medication for children in foster care. This is the sixth webinar in the series, and I'm hopeful that many of you have joined us before. Um, as we begin, I want to express appreciation to the Annie E. Casey Foundation for its support, which enables us to produce this technical assistance webinar series. The goal of the series, as you may have heard me state before, is to provide technical assi assistance through these calls that will inform on-the-ground efforts to improve the oversight and monitoring of psychotropic medication use among the foster care population. While many of the strategies you will hear today are specific to the foster care population, this work is definitely applicable to the broader population of children in Medicaid who receive psychotropic medications. So our topic for today, stakeholder engagement. And so the question we're asking to start framing today's session is why focus on stakeholder engagement? Uh, stakeholders are important to quality improvement efforts. They're certainly important to a number of efforts in the healthcare delivery system, but specific to this work, we're thinking about how we improve the quality of the oversight and monitoring processes that states have in place. The quality of care affects all stakeholders, either directly or indirectly. And the definition of stakeholder reminds us that these are individuals or entities who can influence the success of the QI initiative. And so some specific uh, reasons to focus on engagement are listed on the slide. Um, you want to prioritize your areas for improvement. There are often many areas that could use improvement or attention, but stakeholders can help you to prioritize those. They can also help you to identify resources that might be beyond the resources you have available in your own organization to join with that to support the improvement efforts. Stakeholders can also help you assess the impact of your intervention and suggest how you might address gaps. So oftentimes we would expect that the stakeholders uh, in our systems may often be aware of things that are not going as intended before we may be aware of those. And so we want them to help us assess uh, what's happening out there where things have been implemented. And then finally, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but some very key uh, reasons to focus on stakeholder engagement. Stakeholders can help you advocate for the sustainability of successful interventions. And so we know that when families and youth are engaged, when something is meeting their needs and is helping them to maximize their potential, they're more likely to be uh, committed advocates for that in ways that some of us that are involved in the system may not be able to do. Next slide, please. So now that we've stated why it's important, let's talk just for a moment about what stakeholder engagement is and the way that we're thinking about it. Stakeholder engagement is a process, and it's a process by which the organization involves people who might either be affected by the decision that organization makes or can influence the implementation of those decisions. Um, some of those stakeholders may be in direct relationship with your agency. Others may be more distal but still in important roles that could impact the success of your QI initiatives. So it's important that they be uh, involved in the process and that stakeholder engagement be part of your thought process. Next slide, please. 
so when we think about this work, who are the stakeholders? Uh, and, and this is a definition that you, you might actually have other dimensions that you could think of from, based on the work that you're doing. Um, but in our thinking, the stakeholders are those individuals or entities who pay for, provide, regulate, receive, measure, monitor, or otherwise interact with or influence the processes or outcomes that you want to improve. Um, and here I've just noted a few examples of both internal and external stakeholders. Many times we only think about our external stakeholders, but internal stakeholders are also very, very important. And so we've just listed a few of those here for your reference. Next slide, please. So the next slide is a graphic that you will see, and it's an arrow that actually depicts from left to right the continuum for stakeholder engagement. And in that continuum, we look at, from left to right, minimal levels of um, potential impact or engagement up to the top right uh, end of the arrow, pretty significant engagement. Um, and with that, the ability of the stakeholders to influence the process and to some extent, with some caveats, um, it's, it's in parallel with the level of input they, that they have into the process. So at the far left end or the beginning of the arrow, what I've got is you're providing them with information. I think, again, this is a place where you could see that there potentially could be a caveat because, as we all know, in some situations, just providing information to stakeholders can actually result in a powerful impact on what you're trying to do depending upon how they use that information. So we go from this very basic level of providing stakeholders with information to actually soliciting information or creating a dialogue for, uh, with those stakeholders, engaging them in discussion, inviting them to actually sit at the table and participate in the planning process, giving them a role in the monitoring process. So that kind of uh, alludes to the point I was making a little bit earlier about them being sentinels in some way about how our quality improvement efforts may be playing out on the ground. And then kind of the penultimate um, level of stakeholder engagement, as, as I've reflected it here, has to do with enabling stakeholders to actually participate in the decision-making process. So with that, I'm hopeful that you've got a little bit of a, of a frame for how we're thinking about stakeholder engagement. Uh, and the real meat of the call is coming uh, from, our, from our speakers. So with that, I want to move right to our technical assistance presentations for today from Texas and Ohio, and I'm going to turn to my colleague Jessica Lipper to move us into that part of the call. Thank you, Kamala. <clears throat> I have the pleasure of introducing today's presenters from the state of Texas. Cheryl Fisher began her career as a therapist for the Victim Assistance Center in Houston, Texas, where she provided counseling services focusing on child victims of physical and sexual abuse. She later worked as a program administrator for a community mental health center providing clinical oversight to case management and psychosocial rehabilitation programs for adults and children. Cheryl came to Sympatico in 2010 as the clinical manager for foster care in Texas and is currently the senior director of foster care operations. In her current role, she provides oversight to Sympatico's service management program for children in foster care in Texas and has worked to establish similar programs in Kentucky, Kansas, Mississippi, New Hampshire, and Florida. Joining Cheryl today is Kathy Teich. Kathy has been with the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services for over 25 years as the current Division Administrator for Medical Services at Child Protective Services, and formerly as a Program Specialist, Trainer, and Caseworker. She has experience in both the Child Protective Services and Adult Protective Services programs. Prior to employment with DFPS, Kathy worked in various positions as a nurse, including pediatric, pediatric and adult intensive care, general pediatric nursing, home health, patient education, and discharge planning. She has served on numerous work groups and councils, including the Texas Department of Assistive and Rehabilitation Services Early Childhood Intervention Advisory Council. Kathy has also served on the Texas Supreme Court Permanent Judicial Commission for Children, Youth, and Families Psychotropic Medication Workgroup and on the Committee to Update the 2013 
psychotropic medication utilization parameters for children and youth in foster care. And with that, I will turn it over to Kathy. Good afternoon. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you today our journey in Texas, which began about 10 years ago, engaging stakeholders to ensure that psychotropic medications are prescribed and used appropriately in our foster care population. Um, today's presentation, I'm going to talk to you about some different efforts over the years that our child welfare agency has used to engage stakeholders, followed by Cheryl Fisher, who's going to talk about ways that Star Health, which is our managed care organization for children in foster care, has have done the same. Uh, the next slide, please. And as you can see, over the years, we've engaged a number of different stakeholders, depending on the situation, across the child welfare system, which have included our, our, our child welfare agency, our Medicaid and mental health agency, judges, court-appointed special advocates, attorneys, residential providers, legislative staff, and so forth and so on. Next slide, please. Um, I believe that our success today has largely been the result of a great deal of collaboration where we've brought people together to talk. And I can also say that in some situations, some of the work groups may be started out a little polarized and a little uncomfortable. But I believe that continuing to communicate and talk through those things has brought people together to work collaboratively and as a result has really strengthened our system. We, as I said before, our journey began in 2004 um, as a result of a lot of concern about psychotropic medication prescribing in Texas by judges, legislators, child welfare staff, and foster care providers and lots of different people. As a result, Texas um, brought together a group, it was our first group really to, to work on this, called the Advisory Committee on Psychotropics. And then followed by that, and I'm going to go into more detail about these different collaborations as we go on, followed by that, we had the release of the Psychotropic Medication Utilization Review Parameters. And then in 2005, the same year, there was a lot of legislative effort targeted to improving health care, where there was some legislation passed for us to have um, specific ways of consenting for medical care, as well as providing a comprehensive health care model for children in, in Texas foster care. Then in 2008, Star Health began as a result of the work that began in 2005 to create a comprehensive health care model. And part of that healthcare model, they have a psychotropic medication utilization review process. Finally, in 2003, we had another House bill that sort of aimed at improving practices that were already there, strengthening informed consent, strengthening training, strengthening the way that we provided information to youth who age out of our system. Next slide, please. And we're proud to say that as a result of the efforts over the years of many people collectively across the state, we have um, successfully decreased the use of psychotropic medication by 34%. As you can see, in 2005, there's a little dip, as we're going to talk a little bit further. That's when we first introduced our parameters. And then there's another little dip in 2008 where Star Health began functioning and began having psychotropic medication utilization reviews. Next slide, please. So the accomplishments, again, are that we reduce psychotropic medication by 34%. And also, just by everybody working together with many diverse views, we've created a multi-tiered system of oversight and monitoring that has a lot of different levels of checks and balances. Those include things with child welfare, our child welfare agency, as well as foster care agencies, as well as we have judicial review of medical care, what judges do. And then finally, the review that, that um, Star Health provides. So as we move forward, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the different strategies and some of the work groups that we've used and ways we've engaged and educated providers. Next slide, please. 
starting back in 2004, um, our child welfare agency and our Medicaid agency and our mental health agency convened what's called the DFTS Advisory Committee on Psychotropic Medications. And this was just the first group that we had that brought together a lot of people to really talk about, you know, what is the problem? What are some things that we can do to address the problem? So some of the participants included healthcare providers, residential providers or foster care providers, advocates, foster parents, youth, human services professionals from the different state agencies. And the goal was really to look at the issues and make some recommendations. So at the conclusion of the meetings, there was a report that recommended that we establish some clinical consultation and monitoring system and also to strengthen training for everybody across the child welfare system. Next slide, please. So, in order to really have a monitoring system, there was general recognition that we had to have some basis that we all agreed on for reviewing cases for appropriate regimens. At the time, you know, everybody had their, their uh, definition or their view or perspective of what an appropriate psychotropic medication regimen was. And it could be different if you were a caseworker, if you were a judge, if you were, you know, a doctor, whatever. And so there was recognition that we needed to come up with some kind of standard guidelines. So at that time, the state convened a group of experts in this particular case. It primarily consisted of um, psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health experts, pharmacists, those type of people who developed the first set of guidelines in 2005. Now, since that time, we've had updates where we've had um, subsequent groups that have included some of the same people, but maybe some others. And those have occurred in 2007, um, 2010, and 2013. And in the latter years, the department, our child welfare agency, has partnered largely with the University of Texas School of Pharmacy that does some research for us and, and has contributed a great deal. Um, so the goal, again, was to develop some kind of guidelines and also some review criteria. And these guidelines were distributed or among many of the Texas um, physicians groups for review and input. And then the, the most recent edition in, in 2013, we've also obtained um, input from Rutgers University. Next slide, please. So our parameters, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. You can see on the list of resources, but they see it, Basically, they contain some general principles. They have nine criteria indicating the need for further review of a, a child's regimen. And these are things like, in the beginning, it was five or more, and it's dropped to four or more in um, psychotropic medications in recent years, class polypharmacy, a very young child, and so on and so forth. And also, it can contains like medication tables at the end of psychotropic medications that are used for children with the name, dosages, and that's both the FDA and literature-based um, dosages, black box warnings, and so forth. And then in the, the most recent edition also contains evidence-based assessment and treatment. Um, next slide, please. So we, we introduced these new parameters, and we had the challenging task of really educating stakeholders across the system so that there would be buy-in and, and awareness and ability to use those. So we had a number of different methods to do that. For one thing, our Medicaid agency distributed them to Medicaid providers. This was, again, in 2005, and Star Health didn't come about to 2008. Then we also, within our child welfare agency, sent out um, memos to staff and to our foster care providers. We incorporated them into our residential contract. And then at the time, um, I was the only person in the agency that really was in a healthcare role. I'm an RN. And so my task for about five or six months was um, to um, review concerns, and I would outreach to doctors. We would basically send letters saying, you know, in our role as parents, um, please give us 
um, an explanation of why you think this child needs this regimen and so forth. Send out the parameters. But also um, send information to caseworkers and and foster care agencies. And in general, it was a really good education piece. A lot of our staff, as well as our foster care providers, were really pleased and they said, this helps us a lot. You know, we're really grateful for this. There was also the piece of outreaching to doctors and it was somewhat mixed. Um, and, and again, you know, we would hear the usual concerns that they would deal with, that they would get children newly from other RTCs, they would move around, they were very complex, and they were trying to prevent placement breakdown. So we would hear some of that. But I can say that over the years, as I've watched some of those same doctors who used to be a long time ago, you know, some of our top prescribers, I've seen a number of them really come into compliance and, and work on that. And then finally, our final effort really was that we worked together to educate judges. In our state, we have what's called judicial review of medical care, where we're required to put a lot of detail about psychotropic medications in our court reports that caseworkers submit to the court. And we would have judges asking a, a lot of questions about, are these medications appropriate? What about the diagnosis? And they would be all referring to their own books and coming from a different place. So we also felt a need to get them on board and, and share the parameters with them. So we made some nice packets that we distributed. And we came up with these laminated sheets that were those tables at the end that talked about the meds and what they, um, the dosages and side effects and so forth, and we provided those and also presented at judges' conference. And, and really, they were very pleased too. They were very happy to have this information. And, and so this effort kind of helped us all get on the same page regarding the parameters. Next slide, please. Um, during that time, we also recognize, I, I, I think um, our agency recognized that we sort of needed some more help. We didn't have any doctors working at, with us at the time. And over the years, we had communicated a lot with our um, mental health agency as well as our Medicaid agency that had doctors and asked them for more assistance. So our Medicaid agency brought together another work group that at that particular time was just state agency people to look at what we could do before Star Health came up in 2008 to continue our work and to continue ensuring appropriate prescribing. So, and we came up with what we call interim strategies, which really um, was just a lot of efforts to just continue the work. So some of the things that we did um, were to, first of all, we felt like we needed some expertise, and so our agency did um, subcontract with a child and adolescent psychiatrist who not only consulted with our agency, but, but also with that interagency work group. And eventually we hired our own medical director in 2007 who is a child and adolescent psychiatrist, which has been great for us. We also began realizing that we needed to kind of analyze the data. You know, I knew that I was getting lots of concerns from everywhere, but we felt like we needed to really look at the data to guide strategy. And also to, so I'm, I'm ready for the next slide. So at that point, we began our our child and adolescent psychiatrist, who was a consultant, kind of worked with some data experts within the, the, the agencies to look at Medicaid claims data. And, and they chose to look at it over a 60-day period. And the reason for that is we know with claims data that Medicaid prescriptions are filled for 30 days. And so in order to know that they didn't just get the prescription and take it for a couple of days, they wanted to wait until the child had refilled it. And then that was how we decided that they were on it. But again, it, it looked at the data in a, in a number of different aspects. And, and the report also showed that 
for the five months before the release of the parameters and the five months afterwards that there was a reduction in psychotropic medication use um, in the categories of five or more class polypharmacy and no mental health diagnosis. So Texas since then has been began collecting data every year. Our Medicaid agency does that and we put it on our website. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned before our interim strategies and what we did um, during those times was our Medicaid agency, as a result of that interagency collaboration and ideas that were generated, decided to distribute newsletters to physicians. It was just about the parameters and different things. They also distributed individual letters to physicians that were private that kind of let them know where they ranked in relation to the other physicians who prescribed psychotropic medications to children. And so, you know, like your third highest or whatever. Um, they also, we had a, like a, a focus group that was convened in January of 2007, and it was led by a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist with nine of our top prescribers. And I want to say that the effort and the intent was really to work collaboratively with those physicians to really hear, you know, we kind of approached it or, or our, our psychiatrist approached it as, you know, we know you have really difficult cases and can you tell us about that? And so we really listened to them and all the issues that, that they have with our children and then also talked about, you know, how they could come into compliance with the parameters. And, and I felt like that was very successful. You know, again, one of our very top prescribers um, over the years has, has worked really, really hard to bring his, um, his, his um, practice in, within to the parameters. Again, the next day we had like a conference where we invited all the physicians who treat children in foster care and kind of talked about the parameters as well as other mental health issues. And then finally, again, like I said, we, we had a, we had, we actually um, developed a training, and by that time, it was a psychotropic medication training. By that time, our agency had hired regional nurses in different areas of the state that work for CPS. And so we developed a training that our nurses could present to CPS staff. Next slide, please. I want to Let's see, the, the, final, the next thing that really happened that was major in our um, area was we worked with um, the HHSC agency, which is our Medicaid agency, and later Superior Health Plan Network, which is the contractor for our comprehensive health care program, which we, we call Star Health. And there was a lot of effort to really, for three years, it wasn't like we were trying to introduce managed care to, for cost savings. The effort was always, the, the emphasis was always on trying to better improve foster care or health care the way it was delivered to children in foster care. There was a lot of effort to have coordinated and decreased the fragmentation. So we worked together a great deal over that. And, and just say once again, you know, there, were, there was a collaboration, and I believe that we came up with a much better program because of that time that we put in working together to come up with the best possible health care plan for our children. Cheryl is going to talk a little bit more about that, but one really cool aspect of that as well as we have what we call joint team meetings, which again is another collaboration where we bring together our Medicaid agency, our child welfare agency, as well as the Star Health leadership to kind of look at problems and plan innovations for how we can better improve aspects of care. And then also Star Health again conducts the psychotropic medication utilization reviews, which is based on those parameters. Next slide, please. So another collaboration that we had was more in recent years with our Texas Supreme Court Permanent Judicial Commission for Children, Youth, and Families, which we call the Children's Commission. And they collaborated to bring a number of stakeholders together, and they were kind of viewed as a neutral party. And, and so it was very effective in our state for engaging lots of folks 
including doctors, but also judges, attorneys, CASA, advocates, and so forth. So one of the, some of the things that we had was in the beginning there was a work group that was chaired by a judge as well as our DFCS medical director. So that was kind of the beginning where we would meet periodically and come up with ideas and that work group kind of culminated in a round table um, for lots of Texas stakeholders. And again, it was just broad based and in that meeting, we had a, a, an external facilitator, which was very helpful in keeping us on task and bringing all the parties together. And really, largely, what we, what we achieved was just a lot of communication about the issues and so forth. Following that, um, it led into the legislative session. There was a report that came out, I want to say that, a report that had 12 recommendations for how to improve the system. And so there was a lot of recognition that we've achieved a lot in Texas, you know, that we're proud of what we've achieved, that we've made all of this progress with the parameters, but also recognition that it was a retrospective process. And there was interest among stakeholders and others about in strengthening the upfront process, which really has to do with making sure those people that are giving consent for psychotropic medications are giving informed consent, really have those discussions with doctors and make informed decisions. There was a lot of um, interest in empowering those people with knowledge and tools to really go and have those conversations and make meaningful decisions. There was a lot of interest in making sure that we, that medical consenters and everyone across the system look at non-pharmacological interventions and that kind of thing. And so again, it was just another big collaboration. Next slide. Some of the outcomes of that were that we came up with a form that we are required to complete at for, for the prescription of each new psychotropic medication. So basically it has a checklist where the medical consenter and doctor discuss certain things and both sign it. We also updated our medical consent training. So in our state, we're required to complete medical consent training by statute before the person can make medical decisions for a child. So we updated that and made it annual and put a lot of more stuff about informed consent for psychotropic medications in there, and trauma-informed care and other things. And then also at the conclusion, the person has to sign something saying that they recognize the need for informed consent or the principles of informed consent and the need to consider non-pharmacological interventions. We updated our online psychotropic medication training. And again, both of those trainings are required annually by many members. We came up with a really uh, family-friendly brochure making decisions about psychotropic medications that's sort of at a sixth grade level. And there was recognition with that that many of our folks may not understand the complexities of some of the online trainings and that this is just a tool that they can take with them to, it goes through our whole process and all of our requirements all the way from I've got a child with behavioral problems or issues, what do I do through my first doctor's visit, what do I need to take, the kind of questions, what I need to tell the doctor, the kind of questions I need to ask the doctor, follow-up visits, and so forth. And once again, I felt like that we came up with some of these, all of these tools had a lot of stakeholder input into, we shared them, you know, we would draft things and share them with the group as we developed them, and, and, and we came up with a much better product through all of that collaboration. Next slide, please. And some other things I alluded to, we, we revised the youth transition plan to address physical and mental health care resources for youth. And that has been real helpful. We've, in, in some of our transition meetings with youth, I've, I've heard good reports that, that youth didn't know they could have input into their medical care and they're starting to ask questions and, and have goals of finding out more about their psychotropics or if they're they want to take less psychotropics. They have the, maybe a goal of at their next healthcare appointment, talk to the doctor about what it would take to get off that. So it's been a tool for having a lot more youth engagement. Um, we also have a requirement to notify parents of initial psychotropics. That's a statutory requirement. 
we enhanced judicial review of medical care, which for us has happened since 2005, but there's a lot more detail added to what we have to say in those, such as making sure that we have regular follow-up visits with a healthcare provider every 90 days, ensuring that we considered all the non-pharmacological interventions appropriately before or along with psychotropics. And then also, again, as a result of a lot of the collaboration, we've had a lot of um, ownership from the different parties to educate their group of people. So for Texas, you know, for our child welfare agency, you know, we took ownership of educating our staff as well as our our um, foster care providers and or making sure they get educated in developing those kind of resources and, and tools. And then the Children's Commission took it up on themselves to make sure that judges and attorneys are trained. And then CASA, which is our court-appointed special advocates, they took it up on themselves to train volunteers and advocates. So before I pass it on to Cheryl, I just want to say once again that I've really appreciated and felt like our collaboration has just been extremely important. Our child welfare agency could not have done it alone or tackled this problem alone. And we've used stakeholders just across the whole gamut, all the way from helping us to better understand what the issue is, as all the way up through developing materials and getting their input on them to make sure that they're effective to implementing and helping us train. So with that said, I would like to pass it on to the next Texas presenter, Cheryl Fisher. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm going to take it up and just talk a little bit about um, Star Health and give you kind of a little bit of a context um, to, to uh, what we do in terms of applying the uh, psychotropic medication utilization review process. Um, and then um, if we have time, I'll go over just more of the nuts and bolts on how that works, um, but certainly sprinkle in the collaboration piece as well because that's really been the key to the whole process and the success that we've seen. Um, so our medication monitoring through Star Health, just to let you guys know that, that Kathy had described previously that Star Health is the name of the managed care program serving the children in foster care across the state of Texas. Um, we serve really as the, the primary medical home for the, for the children in foster care and coordinate their physical and behavioral health um, needs. We have a broad network of providers and we also enlist the assistance of a medical advisory committee um, who monitors uh, all of the healthcare services that we provide, including this uh, medication review process. Um, and really the, what we're going to talk about today is the fact that we have been delegated that responsibility for implementing the Psychotropic Medication Utilization Review Program, which we call PMUR. Next slide, please. Um, so what do we do as part of that process? Um, we've got um, lots of different responsibilities related to that. One of those is really credentialing and contracting with the behavioral health providers that are in the Star Health Network. So for individuals to deliver services to children in foster care, they do need to be a part of our network, um, and we are able to um, basically fulfill some of the functions within the PMUR process through, this, through the provider network. Um, we also take it upon ourselves to really educate the stakeholder groups working in collaboration with um, with DSPS and our Medicaid um, state office. We do a lot of education with the stakeholder groups, making sure that they're very much aware of um, the processes that are in place and the expectations related to the parameters that have been implemented. And then, of course, we do screen the medication regimen for all the children in foster care across the state who are prescribed any kind of psychotropic medication. Next slide, please. Um, the credentialing process for the providers does end up being a piece of what we do in terms of our uh, work with the PMUR process. We do um, ensure that they, they see contract language related to the prescribing parameters and the expectations that are associated with that. Um, that also means that any changes that may be made to the parameters require some notification to the providers as well. So if there is a change to the parameters, we do uh, make that notification within, uh, at least, with at least 60 days notice to our providers. Next slide, please. We really have found that education is the key. I know Kathy talked a little bit about that before. I think you're going to hear the same kind of theme from me. Really educating all the stakeholder groups ends up being the, the key to the success of this type of a program. Um, you know, when you start talking to folks, you're not going to find very many people who, who disagree with you with the notion that, that we want to see kids who prescribe 
um, really the least amount of medications possible to uh, make them be successful within the community. So I think everyone can pretty much agree and rally around you want kids to get the medications that they need, but you don't want them getting medications that they don't need. And so a huge piece of this has been educating the different stakeholder groups, and the process has been a little bit different with each group. So, of course, we have our provider education, um, really, that's targeting those prescribers. So, we have written materials that go out that have detailed information about the parameters. We have newsletters, a provider newsletter that um, updates them about any changes, refers them to different uh, websites and things like that where they can get more education. But really, where I think that the, the most education happens is during the peer-to-peer -peer consult. With a medication review, um, the the ones the those who are found to be outside of parameters receive a phone call from our medical director, and they talk about um, the the parameters about the case, um, and that's really I think a key moment in time for us to be able to engage those providers. In the beginning, we saw providers who were really resistant to the whole process. I think they were concerned about um, us trying to take over the case or something along those lines. But by really approaching the providers in a real collaborative type of a way, I think we've been able to really um, change the perspective that the providers have on that process. And so um, with, with that collaborative process with the prescriber, we're really able to talk on a case-by-case -case basis about what's going on with a particular child and really try to problem solve what can change. Um, our medical director is certainly not taking over the case or dictating prescribing practices, but might be able to offer a fresh set of eyes, talk about different things that might be tried um, to be able to try to, to reduce medications when we can. Next slide, please. We've also needed to do education with the DSPS caseworkers. So, um, you know, this has been a little bit of a challenge just because there are so many caseworkers that are out in the field. They are very, very busy um, and, and out in the community. That's their job. And to try to train them on the parameters and the process and, and what to look for has certainly been something that's been required a collaboration between us and the DSPS state office. So while the um, state office does have um, the training that Kathy has described related to psychotropic medications, we also have a web-based training that we do for the, uh, for the caseworkers as well. We really found that, that a web-based type of a system seems to work best so that um, staff can uh, access that at their convenience. Um, and really looking at these key points um, that, we wanted to that we want to bring out to them. Um, so in collaboration with DSPS, we were able to establish what those key points would be that we felt like the caseworkers needed. And that's really been the description of the prescribing parameters, information on how to request a PMUR, because if they identify a case that seems to be outside parameters, we want them to be able to kick that over to us as quickly as possible for a review. And then also providing them with those regional points of contact um, so that they can address any kinds of questions or concerns and, and those kinds of things that's been very critical. Next slide, please. Um, the, the education of judges has been another issue as well. Um, so we definitely wanted to provide just a, a different type of uh, collaboration with them to get their involvement. Um, and of course, we've done what your traditional means of, of education with, with any kind of stakeholder, the written materials, uh, meetings with them as a group. But we've also done some individual meetings as well. Um, especially with judges that have had some specific questions or specific concerns. Um, but what we really saw was a trend in judges really just having general questions about medication. So um, maybe it wasn't related to um, something that fell outside parameters, but they just had a question about a certain dosing, um, is this medication appropriate for this diagnosis, those kinds of questions. And we found that they were requesting PMURs for that, and that really didn't answer that question. So through our meetings with the judges and, and talking with them, we established um, the judge's medication mailbox. And it's essentially a dedicated email address um, that is manned by one of our um, Star Health Service coordinators um, to receive the question from the judge. It cannot be specific with any kind of um, child-specific information. So we take that information and we are able to get an answer from them from our medical director. And if we see that there's a concern about a specific case, we might then ask that the judge request a PMUR on that if it seems like there's something that we're concerned about. But it's an easy way for the judges to be able to get some quick information related to some medication. Um, and we've been able to partner with them on that. And that's something that's definitely been well received. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have um, the medication review process. The next few slides, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to just kind of really do a, a very high level of overview and go through those pretty quickly. Uh, but I do want to highlight that this is a retrospective process. So this, um, the 
the uh, PNUR occurs after a child has been on a medication regimen for at least 60 days, as Kathy had described previously. Um, so this is the PNUR is retrospective, and we do have a prospective process as well. That's kind of a stopgap at the point of sale of the pharmacy, uh, requiring a prior authorization for certain dosages and, and things of that nature. So we do have two processes, but the PNUR process itself is a retrospective process. Next slide. Um, you can see that we identify cases for review in a variety of different ways. We use our case management staff to identify issues that they refer over to us. Um, the automated screening process, we have an automated program that reviews the claims data for the pharmacy, uh, fill information, and we identify cases that way. We can also get requests from any external stakeholders, so anybody within the community that has a concern about the medication is um, definitely welcome to um, make a referral for PMUR, and then, of course, we do have our judges who make a um, request or order the PMUR to occur. Next slide. Um, this just details our action steps related to gathering the information. You'll be able to see that there's a, a, a basically kind of a review of the case that happens prior to a peer-to-peer -peer contact that happens. Um, I think really what I would like to take you to take from this is that we try to be very respectful of the prescriber's time and to outreach to them only in those cases where we're fairly certain that there hasn't been any change that's brought the medication within parameters um, extremely recently. And so we get, gather as much information as we can so that when we do have that peer-to-peer -peer consult, we do know that the medications are indeed outside parameters and we need to have that kind of a conversation. Next slide, please. Um, we do communicate those results once the medication uh, review is completed. We do have a written report that's, um, that's created and then it's distributed to um, the DSPS um, uh, staff and then also the requester as well to kind of close that loop so that folks have access to that information and can see the, the results of the PMUR that happened and the recommendations that were made. Next slide. Um, if we do have concerns, once we've identified um, that the medications are outside parameters, sometimes um, it doesn't happen very often, but it could happen that we are really concerned about some potential side effects and um, that, um, that there's a risk for. And so if that's the case, our medical director will contact the DSPS medical director, director to share those concerns. And um, in that case, we can make some pretty quick changes um, and decisions about some changes that might need to be made um, to either the prescriber or the medication regimen in general. Next slide, please. So we do have report our outcomes as well, and I think that that's been key to keeping the stakeholders involved too. And um, letting them see the results, I think, is is really critical to keep them engaged in the process and and to keep them um, allow them to see that what what um, they've really worked together to develop. It's something that does appear to be working. Um, so we do have a quarterly report that we uh, complete, and we um, that includes information such as the number of screenings that were completed, the number of full PMURs that were done, the referral source, uh, the results of the review, any quality of care concerns that might be coming about. Those kinds of things get reported on a quarterly basis, and that goes to our state Medicaid office and is also shared with DSPS. Also reviewed in our, medic, uh, our medical advisory committee and in our psychotropic medication um, monitoring work group, too. Next slide, please. Um, as far as oversight of the PMUR process, um, I just mentioned the psychotropic medication monitoring group. This is a group that was put together by the DSPS medical director that involves um, experts and folks from um, different state agencies um, and that have really a vested interest in this process. Um, and they meet um, once a quarter to review the results of the PMUR, um, the, the quarterly reports, and then also discuss the trends that we're seeing um, with the, the prescribing practices. And then they also oversee the biennial review of the parameters themselves um, and recommend any kind of revisions um, that need to be made as a result of any new research that's come about and, and those types of things. So they really serve as an oversight of that entire PMUR process um, and, and can um, assist with making any kind of recommendations for changes. Next slide. Um, and here is just a list of some important links if you want to get some more information about the parameters or some of the trainings that we have. You can see there are some links there as well. And then the next slide is just the contact information. If you guys have questions um, that you would like to follow up with Kathy or I about after this presentation, you can certainly feel free to reach us via email there. And that concludes my section of the presentation. 
Thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Kathy, for that informative presentation. We are making a slight modification to our schedule for this afternoon's webinar. To ensure that we get through our next presentation, we will be collecting questions and holding them for the end. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next presenters from the state of Ohio. <clears throat> Dr. Mary Applegate is, a double boarded, is double boarded in pediatrics and internal medicine. After over 20 years of experience in rural private practice, Dr. Applegate serves as the medical director of Ohio Medicaid. She is responsible for infusing high quality in clinical medicine into the program, driving improvements in health outcomes for Medicaid beneficiaries. She spearheads the perinatal work group for the Medicaid Medical Directors Network and co-chairs the CMS expert panel to improve maternal and infant outcomes. Presenting with Dr. Applegate is Dr. Mina Chang. Dr. Chang is the Chief of Health Research and Program Development at the Ohio Department of Medicaid. She directs statewide research, quality improvement, and multi-stakeholder collaborations and oversees Medicaid contracts in support of efficient and effective administration of the Medicaid program. Dr. Chang has extensive experience with continuous quality improvement strategies and outcomes-driven collaborations with leaders of health systems, health plans, providers, regulators, and consumers. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Chang. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Mary Applegate and myself are very honored to have this opportunity to share Ohio Mice Matter uh, experience with everyone. It's a Ohio Psychotropic Medication Quality Improvement Collaborative. Um, we will spend a little bit of time uh, over use this program, but we will concentrate our community engagement strategy um, to go over those strategies with you. Um, Ohio Minds Matter um, is an initiative um, that our governor's office and Ohio Department of Medicaid invested over a million dollars for three years. Um, in order to ensure the success of this initiative, we partner with our uh, private and um, public uh, partners uh, called Beacon, uh, that is best evidence for advancing child health in Ohio now. Um, this part is a very established partnership, has been uh, working spearheading several quality improvement initiatives for um, um, the, focusing on the uh, improving child health in Ohio. Um, we also partner with them at this initiative. Um, the group helped us establish the goal for the next three years uh, for this initi initiative is to in increase timely access to safe and effective psychotropic medication and other treatments, and improving pediatric health outcomes, reducing potential of adverse effects. And as you know, many of the children in Medicaid have complex behavioral health care needs, and in particular, in children in foster care, they are more likely to experience trauma, more likely to have social-emotional issues early in life, and we also know that there are evidence that they have also have higher prescribing rates on the atypical antipsychotics and are more likely to have multiple uh, medication. Our focus, instead of a very regu regulatory um, uh, intention, uh, we uh, take on a quality improvement approach that um, the priority for us is education, safety, and empowerment. And uh, we like to use a educational and uh, learning approach to be able to advance the understanding of uh, the use of psych psychotropic medication, uh, working with our prescribers, uh, parents, um, child welfare workers, uh, school uh, judges, and all the, all the stakeholders that are uh, uh, integral, integral to the uh, continuum of care for the children. So uh, the foremost, although three, three of the priority are equally important, um, the, the foremost is education, and that's the, um, the, the approach we are taking uh, to engage our uh, stakeholders. Um, the targets for this initiative um, is to reduce 25% uh, for each of the, the goal um, in the targets, uh, the use, to reduce 25% in the use of AAP medication in children, 
less than six years of age, two or more concurrent AAP medication for over two months duration, four more psychotropic medication for children that are younger than 18 years old. Um, Ohio used a learning and community collaborative approach, and many of you are probably very familiar with this approach. It's very well vetted and developed by Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, using a rep rapid cycle quality improvement model. Um, the, there are two uh, attributes of this model that's well noted. One is that we, we could test those uh, in a very small subset of sample that before we can scale those tested uh, strategy to a population uh, throughout uh, Ohio. And also, uh, as many of you know, that um, the complexity and healthcare need for those children that oftentimes go beyond um, the, in a clinical practice setting. And so the, the solution may go also call for a much larger collaboration and then goes beyond the clinical setting. So we are really focusing on um, the patient, uh, is a patient center and a family center approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the leadership structure, uh, as we noted early on, that we are working in a well-established public and private partnership with Beacon. We also work with a uh, stage steering committee that are uh, representative and leadership group from the Beacon uh, co uh, Collaborative. And um, we have worked with 17 members clinical advisory panel to develop and identify uh, the pilot regions and also identify um, the key stakeholders in those pilot regions. And we also noted that in each pilot region are led by um, a very well respected uh, clinician in those community. Even though the leadership charts look pretty much top down, but I wanted to point out that um, there are leadership embedded in each of the national structure, state, uh, uh, pardon me, the statewide structure, regional structure, as well as in the community structure. So that allows us to be able to communicate timely and be able to mobilize resources, tap into those uh, statewide groups, as well as uh, the community groups. Um, the clinical advisory panel as I indicated, it's the 17 minimal members that are experts in pediatric psychiatry and pharmaco uh, pharmacology. Um, they help us develop um, and review guidelines um, in uh, clinical guidance and technical resources, which that Dr. Mary Applegate will go into more detail later. They also provide the clinical guidance to the quality improvement team and uh, provide continue to provide uh, faculty, faculty and uh, uh, resources to our uh, clinicians that are participating in those uh, pilot regions. And currently, we just kick off a one-to-one -one mentoring approach that be able to uh, support our clinician in those pilot regions. Um, this is um, a little bit about uh, how those uh, community stakeholders were structured. Um, as we indicated, Ohio in this initiated those pilot efforts in those 13 counties in three regions of Ohio. Each of the region is led by a well-respected clinical leaders, and we also work with identify um, 64 prescribers from 17 um, either large hospital or large practices to be the early adopter in those pilot efforts. Um, the community setting, those theory committee members, inclusive of those key partners that are um, um, very critical to the network of care for those children. Um, that will be inclusive of early adopters, um, let, such as pedi pediatricians, psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, and family physicians. Uh, we also have representation of managed care plans, um, children's service agency, child and family court, advocacy uh, representative, youth and parents, as well as school uh, working together to identify issue and come together to um, de derive uh, resources and recommend uh, strategy for um, intervention. So at this point, let me um, turn over to Dr. Mary Applegate to talk about the community engagement strategy focusing on education for standardization and guidelines. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, I'm, I'm Mary Applegate. I've been the medical director for Medicaid for two years now, uh, but, but in the trenches in my pediatric practice, I did a large amount of behavioral peds, so I'm very connected to uh, lots of the systems issues. So what Mina walked you through was uh, the fact that first we developed the, the measures, which are actually I want to point out different from those from Texas. When we gathered that clinical advisory panel, um, we, we had to, to basically draw a line in the sand of what counts for safe prescribing and what doesn't. So at the time, we chose, you know, any prescriptions for kids less than age six. And of course, you're all aware now that you really can do risperidone for uh, kids who fall on the autistic uh, spectrum. Um, so there's FDA uh, recommendations around that. But at the time, we didn't. So we didn't actually change that. But that's a very small percentage of who actually gets these drugs. The second one is two or, two or more of the atypical antipsychotics at the same time for more than a six-week washout period. Uh, and then instead of using more than five, we'll use more than four, um, one of which is an atypical antipsychotic. Uh, and in the denominator are all the kids who are actually taking them. So uh, with that, we actually ran our data to show, in fact, that Ohio really did look like the rest of the country and this really, um, we really did have the increases that were overly represented in the Medicaid ranks, which is part of, part of how Medicaid got to be one of the leaders in trying to figure out what to do. So um, we very much have partnered with our children's welfare uh, friends to try to meet federal directives, but really go beyond that. And I think our states are a good contrast in a legislative approach versus a very collegial um, quality improvement approach that engages not just the, the patients and the youth themselves, but we realized we actually had to engage the clinicians because, interestingly enough, all of the docs and clinicians thought it wasn't an issue for them. Um, so I, I, it's, it's interesting to me to listen to the story in Texas and to compare it to what we've done. So we developed, uh, in a rather methodical and deliberate way, toolkits that um, encompass a couple of different um, uh, areas. We realized that doctors and patients and youth actually don't speak the same language, and even in the children's welfare department, we don't speak the same language. So everything we developed was in parallel in three streams, one for the clinicians, the prescribers, second for the, the parents and the youth, and then the third would be other interested parties, typically the schools and the children's welfare agencies. Uh, the resources that were developed were around the three standards of safety. Um, but then also, since folks think in diagnostic buckets, we sort of clump them together um, related to ADHD, uh, related to aggressive behavior, uh, which was a bit of a fight. We found that half the kids in our state who have ADHD are prescribed these drugs, and the reason is for aggression. So we actually simply called that out and made that its own bucket. And then the last group are, are some of the true psychiatric disorders like uh, bipolar disease, for example. So instead of using a diagnosis, we called that mood and irritability. And then uh, the one that folks really look at a lot is just generally what are all the medications, just a general guide to the medications, how they're used, the limits of dosages, side effects, et cetera. The resources then that went into these um, relate to um, the empowerment part that Mina talked about earlier, and that is how do you know what questions to ask when? So we basically made decision trees. We, we kind of took prototypical patients and thought about, well, what are all the things we actually ask? And we, um, if you go to ohiomindsmatter.org, they're, they're long decision trees, but you can actually fly through them pretty quickly uh, to actually show what the decision making is, is around it. And at any point in time, anybody who's involved in the, chair of that, in the care of that child can actually ask. Uh, to break it into bite sizes, we actually have fact sheets related to diagnoses, medications, and a number of other topics of interest. And then to get to the sustainability of this and to keep folks engaged, especially the clinicians, um, we developed uh, learning modules. Uh, on the next slide, you can see the six topics that I ran through. The first three were the measures, and the last three um, were by the diagnostic sort of buckets. And uh, each of them has the recognition, assessment, and diagnosis, including uh, direct links to the DSM criteria. Um, the treatment piece uh, was a great hit because we listed all of them in brackets that included, um, you know, evidence-based versus promising versus uh, we don't know yet, but not harmful. Um, so uh, that was a surprise, I think, to a lot of the communities that we spoke to where they just presumed that certain types of therapy were actually effective for certain diagnoses. 
Um, we also have one on monitoring, so side effects of medications and standards of um, lipid profiles, et, et cetera. And then the, the last one is education, uh, related to kind of bulleted and fairly simple language around uh, the fact sheets related to the resources. So the, the modules uh, actually are kind of fun if anyone would like to have a look at them. They're uh, around all of those six topics. Um, the standard for we used the standard format in all of them, in which case we, in, you know, during which we incorporate at least one case study, and kind of walk through at least one of the algorithms through it. And then there are questions before and afterwards. Um, I note that our slide says it's 60 to 90 minutes, but it actually depends on how much studying you do and how often you actually reference the tables. So they they could take up to two hours, but you really could zip through it faster if you're just looking for key points. Uh, the reason this is important is um, that pediatricians have to have maintenance of certification requirements. So we wanted to encourage general pediatricians and even family docs to actually take on additional mental health competencies as part of their everyday practice, and that gets us to improved access for all of the children in our state. Uh, there are also general continuing medical education and nursing education units um, um, that you can get through these. And these are not, um, you know, owned by any academic institution, uh, so they're actually uh, available online. So the huge part of the engagement here was not just having tools that they could use and kind of the myth busting around the topic, but it really was getting communities around the, the problem. Um, one of the things that we've come to understand with antipsychotics is that there are symptom of uh, deficiencies in, in our mental health delivery system. So, for example, the general pediatricians cannot get mental health services in a mental health um, center unless they actually have a mental health diagnosis. So, you know, if this were the Connecticut shooting, um, you know, they couldn't get services because they're not diagnosed yet. So, the general pediatricians are very aware that we have access issues on the front end just related to the way systems are set up. Uh, we also heard from the psychiatrist that the sickest kids who might be in residential or inpatient settings they actually don't have access to in-home support, and that's actually part of what drives that. So uh, what, what we did is based on the uh, density of safety violations, either by prescriber or by the number of children, we identified um, areas in the state that, that boiled down to 17 practice sites and 64 prescribers who were actually willing to gather in a group with all of the entities that Mina mentioned, the school system, the judicial system, et cetera, to actually try to figure it out. Um, so they actually all have gone through the modules, and then what we do is we meet on a monthly basis in kind of an IHI-style QI effort to share what some of the issues are. Um, each of the prescribers has their information fed back to them. This is on, on slide 55 now. Um, and uh, so they, they get a list of who the children are that they prescri prescribe for that actually were safety violations. Um, and then we ask them to, to check a bucket of, of what has gone into that. So we basically have a diagram of what the issues are. And many of them relate to lack of access to other services. They're simply following someone else's prescription because they don't have a psychiatrist. Um, it was the, the best thing that they could do because there wasn't anything else. Uh, it, it tended to be that knowledge deficits were not it. It was more of the problem-solving skills and complicated circumstances that was the issue. So uh, we pick cases, and then one of the clinicians actually uh, presents it, and we walk through it um, to try to um, capture the lessons learned um, through these monthly calls that we call early adopter action calls. Um, so they tend to be pretty challenging. So we had kids with autism. We had treatment resistance. We had parent resistance. Um, and then related to this, uh, there's a feedback loop. So as time goes on, we're expecting that they capture uh, the lessons and that the safety violations actually will go down. So, uh, you know, as a pediatrician, we love kindergartners because they keep asking why. And so learning from the children, uh, we did this little exercise where we kept asking why. The docs out there actually are not intending to do unsafe stuff. So why are they prescribing outside of the safety guidelines? Well, that's because they failed something earlier that was safer. Well, why did they fail it? Well, because the kids were that sick, the symptoms were that bad, and um, there may not have been standardization in, in, in the key decisions that needed to be made. 
Well, why did that happen? Well, because there's not an access to non-medication, so they had to reach for medications. Um, and there also may be lack of the evidence-based alternative therapies. Well, why did that happen? Well, because the access to diagnosis and specialty services earlier was not available. And in the end, one of the root causes for the general pediatricians is not just lack of awareness and access to mental health, uh, or it actually is the, the lack of access to general men, uh, mental health services. So you can see how just the prescribing gets us to system uh, deficiencies that then through Medicaid we're actually trying to address. So the next couple of slides are simply the results. So here uh, on this slide, for, for our early adopters and the interested communities that are involved, uh, there's been a 28% reduction in the number of children who actually take these medications, and there's also been a, a reduction of those who take them um, in the safety violations that they have. Uh, now, during this time, you all don't know, but we actually moved some of the sicker kids who fall into the age-blind and disabled category, we moved them to managed care. So folks might have said, well, gee, you just moved the sickest kids over, so of course you're better. So this slide just shows the dotted lines of the same children to show that really this is a real difference and it's not related to programmatic changes. The last slide is simply fee-for-service everywhere, showing that really there hasn't been a difference. Um, you know, it's really been in the pilot sites that we've seen a difference. So just generic intention or awareness is not enough. It's all of this structured QI and information and community support around it that actually gets us there. Uh, so the engagement, the empowerment at all levels, we think is actually one of the key messages here. So in terms of future steps, with this advisory panel, you know, how would we take something like this to scale? We actually think we need a sort of mentorship. And so that's actually what we're working on next that then potentially could be available across the state since the data feedback um, is centralized. You don't actually have to be in the same referral or market area. So with this, we're actually going to structure it uh, with consultations and some of the tools that you actually see here on the slide. But in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to uh, hand it back to Mina to, to wrap it up so we have time for a few questions. Great. Thank you, Mary. So the remainder of two community uh, engagement strategy, one is to for the consumer empowerment. And as Dr. Mary Applegate pointed out, there are um, uh, quite a very well-established clinician-based uh, modules and uh, material and technical assistance information on Ohio Minds Matter website. Um, since we are working with our community groups um, that consist of court um, representative, uh, consumer, parent, child welfare workers, that they are helping us vetting um, the material that the content that could be helpful for the consumer and empower them in the shared decision making for their treatment with in conjunction with clinician. So uh, those are the tools that are vetting through our consumer groups now that um, that including preparation mm -hmm. for mental health visit question, personal decision guide, information sharing checklist. And we also have medication side effect watch list, video that will be developed for parents, caregivers, uh, youth, and also some social media um, uh, uh, venue. And then uh, those training modules, we also will be able to uh, provide to the workers and then uh, so they can really better facilitate when uh, con the consumer or family come to the clinic for a visit. And they, are, they will be, uh, fact sheets that based on those uh, shared decision making materials. Um, those will be available upcoming and it will be in public domain. So let me just add here, um, our clinicians felt very strongly that they didn't want the mandated informed consent that, that I noted Texas had in legislation. And part of that was they said the paper didn't really mean anything. What they wanted was this conversation around uh, understanding what the decision points were and what the limits were. So it may be pretty interesting here moving forward to actually see where we end up uh, trying to take all that feedback uh, into consideration because the conversation really has been very, very rich. Uh, so I just wanted to point that contrast out with Texas as well. And also, we, um, since we are pretty much in the community setting, all we hear from uh, our consumer family is that they are, and, and everyone know uh, that um, for low-income uh, families, that the reading level in terms of uh, literacy, that is something that we intended to design and develop so that would uh, be able to utilize uh, those material and be comfortable in the clinical setting to converse with doctors on uh, the medication and ask question that if there are uh, treatment that's available uh, in conjunction with medication. 
So the third strategy, the community engagement, is that, uh, as we indicated, the complexity of the needs for this group of children when beyond clinical setting. So how do we best coordinate and uh, work with the stakeholders? So as you can see, again, this is a patient-centered, family-centered approach that uh, we are actively working with uh, local child and family first council that are serving uh, the high high ends, high deep end, deep high risk and deep ends kids uh, or children in custody, and we will provide a uh, system coordination for them, and then and connecting them to 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 with our early adopters so they know that there are additional resources that can be available to them to help them, and then the intent is to be able to increase coordination as as a part of the QI process is that what can we do together right now? And obviously, resources are gonna vary by region and, and uh, community. So they have those true ownership in terms of how to identify those solutions and work together to de derive those solutions. And we also are connecting them to Medicaid Managed Care Plan. Uh, those earlier results that Dr. Mary show are our uh, small pilot groups. And we feel that um, now we can really uh, engage our wave, wave two providers and then also uh, uh, feedback those data that's covering managed care plan children as well. Right, so we gave the managed care plans the specs for the data and what we're um, working on is actually aggregating them and rolling them up to a statewide uh, reporting of safe prescribing. Uh, so that's the plan and hopefully with opiates to follow not too long later because we realize even in the foster community that's an issue as well. And I think that concluded our um, presentation. And uh, here are our contacts. Feel free to uh, uh, reach in to us. And again, uh, you can find those information. And uh, we didn't have opportunity to uh, do a live demo, but uh, certainly those are very exciting information. And I'd like to have your feedback. It's Ohio Mind Matters uh, dot gov. Org. Uh, dot org. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Back Bad to habits. <laughs> yeah. Back to you. Back to you. Thank you, Mina, and thank you, Mary, for that informative presentation. We will now take some questions. If you have not already submitted a question and would like to, please do so by clicking the Q&A icon located in the floating toolbar at the top of your screen. <clears throat> so, Mina and Mary, are the modules, we received a couple of questions, and I want to make sure that we can get through them. Um, the modules that you discussed, are they open and available to anyone? Um, the decision-making uh, algorithm is available to everyone, but the online learning module um, are, are limited right now that are only available because we, we have their fees and process because we are giving up CME, CEU, and so on and so forth. So right now it's only limited to um, to the uh, Ohio's uh, practitioners. And we also extended this to a limited number for the collaborative, uh, uh, Kamala, with you. Uh, I think there are 50 also practitioners from other states can participate, so. Right, but the materials, when you go and look at the site to learn everything, that's actually not proprietary. Everybody can actually Probably go and look. Not. It's just getting the CMEs or the maintenance of certification because of the fees associated with that to just bring all of that up with the Board of Pediatrics, uh, there are a limited number of spots in the beginning. But right. the materials are absolutely open to everyone, and we've heard from folks around the country um, that they were bright, informative, and, and clear. So we, we're certainly interested in um, what we could do better with it. Great, thank you very much. Um, and then one other question we received. How how is the Ohio Minds Matter program funded? Um, it's our uh, governors um, provided the the grant to us. It's magic. <laughs> uh, so actually, what happened was we realized that this was a, a a crisis, and so we actually structured this in a way to more reliably get to results uh, to get results. And we were very fortunate that. Um, the Office of Health Transformation that includes the Department of Mental Health, uh, the Department of Public Health, as well as Medicaid, so all the, the public agencies, uh, were actually going to uh, contribute and invest in this moving forward. So that was a very specific uh, grant from the Governor's Office. Okay, great. Thank you. Texas, we also have a few questions um, from for you. 
Um, and I'm wondering if someone from your team can talk about the informed consent. Yeah, uh, this is Dr. Rogers. Uh, I'm the medical director here at DFPS, and Kathy and Cheryl did an excellent and thorough presentation. But I, that last, there was a question from Ohio about comments about the informed consent actual form, and that was not legislated. What was legislated was that we improve our informed consent process, and we did that by working on training and getting stakeholder input to make sure that the online training was understandable. But in the, at the end of the summer, where we worked on this for about three months, we really decided that a consent form made sense as an educational tool. And it is signed by both the, uh, provi the prescriber and the medical consenter, which is most often a foster parent. But that form is primarily, it's for a new medication being prescribed. It gives the diagnosis of the child and what that medication's name is. And then it lists the items to be discussed. It's really an educational tool for the provider and for the medical consenter to make sure they've covered uh, the aspects of informed consent. And then it clarifies at the end of the form what if the medical consenter de decides to not consent to the medication and what discussions must they have with the FPS. And also if they decide later to stop giving the medicine to the child, what's expected there. So it's primarily an educational tool. We're still focused on retrospective reviews and allowing practice to go forward. We don't do a lot of upfront blocking of meds being prescribed. Is, is that clear? Kamala, am I making sense for, to you on describing that? Thank you. That sounded great. Okay. It was clear. Okay. Thank you. We have time for one more question for Texas. Um, the question that came in, the, the individual wants to know who does the initial screening of the psychotropic medications for all children in foster care? Sure. We have, this is Cheryl, and um, we have a few different ways that we conduct that screening. So first of all, we have a team of, um, of case managers who follow up on those cases that um, have a higher level of need, and those individuals, um, licensed clinicians, um, who do a, a review of the medications and potentially refer for a PMUR, that that doesn't capture all the children. The, all of the children have the medication regimen reviewed in an automated process, so we basically have an algorithm that's set up to review those, the pharmacy claims data and it pulls out the cases um, that appear to fall outside of the parameters. And those are then reviewed by our medical director to then determine which ones um, will result in gathering more um, clinical documentation from a prescriber and then potentially up to the peer-to-peer -peer outreach. So the, uh, the initial first stages are with our licensed clinical staff and an automated process that we have. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you all for presenting on today's webinar. Um, we need to move on in the interest of time. Slides and video archive will be available on our website shortly. An email announcing the posting of these materials will be sent to today's participants as well. Our next webinar in this series will take place during the month of May and will focus on psychiatric consultation models. We'll have more details available in the coming weeks. We ask that you complete a very brief online evaluation, which will pop up on your screen after this event is finished. Your feedback is very important to us. Finally, we would once again like to thank the Annie E. Casey Foundation for the support of this webinar series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation.